It's been three years since I bought this slab. And finally, I bought it in May of 2020 and I had it flattened. This is gonna be my new desk for my office and I wanna step you through the build of this. We're gonna release two, three, four, five videos on it. Um, all the, all the uh, frustration I went trying to figure out how I wanted to do this. But the best part about this is Big D, come on in here Big D. You have for the last two and a half years that Sedge Tool uh, has been on YouTube. I've taught you quite a bit. Oh yeah. Well, we're gonna put you through your paces, whether using a scrub plane, a Rotex, I'll show you the straight edge. So yes, I know this is a long introduction, but boy, we have a lot, and you're gonna learn a lot more, awesome. but you're gonna put a lot of those skills I've taught you through this. Let's do it. And get ready, because it's time to have some fun. <laughs> All right, Sedge, where do we start? There's a lot to this, Big D. Um, let's talk about the wood first. Okay. Um, when I bought this, my buddy uh, Brian down in Indian Urban Hardwoods, real oh. close friend, uh, he flattened this for us. Um, I, my uh, grandson, you guys all know Daniel, he's been on the channel. He, uh, he picked it out with me. And um, it's ash, is the type of wood. It's beautiful. I don't know where Brian reclaimed this because he reclaims all his wood are all around Indianapolis. I'm going to have you guess, Big D, how much you think this weighs. <laughs> I'm going to say 175. Chris, yell it out. Oh, wait a minute. Yell out your original thought. I thought it was 300. Yep, I was in that line between 250 and 300. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show people uh, what you need to do before you order a desk frame. You've got to look at how much you can get in length, okay, because this is 86, 82, 86. And that frame that I have off to the side that we're gonna assemble will go to 72. So I'm going, okay, what's the stability of that? I bought their commercial version. It was from Uplift, okay, and um, they have an I-beam on the commercial version. So I was worried about side-to-side -side stability, but you also gotta look at this. In here, okay, it is, 29, mm -hmm. okay, they rate theirs for about 30, 36 in depth. And this is 35, so we're good there. We'll have that stability. It's a C-frame, okay. and the feet are 27 and a half. I bought the, once again, the V2 commercial. When you look at the specifications, look at load ratings. I thought this was 300 pounds alone, 250, 300. It's just that it's bulky, okay? Uh, let's weigh it and I'll show you. All right, let's do it. 130. Okay, go like this. I'm going to go like this. <laughs> so, Big D, if we look at this, we had about 130, 123 to 130. Mm -hmm. It blows me away because I thought this was a lot heavier. It's amazing, huh? It's crazy. It's because it's bulky. You're going to see daylight here. Oh, wow. Okay. So we need to take down this side and this side, this dip, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see how much we're gonna take down. It sounds funny, but we got shims here. That's a one millimeter, Ooh, that's a decent gap. Oh, right in the middle, it's about a two millimeter gap. So it's always good to have gauge blocks. So let's think about this. As we go down, we can mark our board. And it's nice that you're here, Big D, because we can work it here and here, not concentrating in here. Follow me? Yep. So as we do this, this may vary, like down there, it may be even heavier, but let's look. It is, it's a little bit heavier. So let's just continue this, and it, st wow, look at that dip. That's all, that's a good dip, right? Yes, sir. So always gauge it, make sure you have a good straight edge, but it's starting to go like this. So as we knock this down, we'll come in this way, and this makes sense because of this checking right here. Okay. Let's look at the blade of a scrub plane. It's actually, it looks just like this. So the part that's cutting is like this. You'll hear it all the time. This is where you hog out a lot of material quick. And everybody goes, well, where's the grain? Which way does it go? Well, you sit a shallow cut. Sometimes it doesn't matter. You want to eliminate as much tear out, but it's not your final cut. We're right. going to go back to leveling and then smoothing. 
Okay, and then as we go, you'll see, oh yeah, look, there's a lot of dips. In other words, what it creates is a lot shallower version of this. Okay. And I always go like this, and then what I do is I come across the grain like this. And basically, when I do look at this, I got little diamonds. Mm -hmm. little okay, it. so when I take a larger plane and I go across it, I'm just taking down the highs and the lows. Not gonna like that. Okay, and we're just, I'm just gonna go like this down the grain. Now, you gotta be careful because I'm starting to get some good tear out here. All right, Sedge, what's next? Now it's time for the heavy metal or the heavy <laughs> iron. This is the number seven. Okay, you have your front and your back. And this will not follow dips. It will start to level it out, those highs and lows that we have. Okay, we won't spend a lot of time on this. But what's gonna happen as we take this, and that's the right way to teach you, you go scrub, seven, and then smoother. And you've okay. used the smoother before. Emphasis on smoothing. Now here's, here's the other thing I'm gonna tell you. After we get the seven and we do a little smoothing, we'll start to check the slab again. Guess what we might have to do? Go so. back to the scrub <laughs> plane. Okay. Okay, then go through the seven, and then go through the four and a half. This is a lot of work, but man, this will hone your hand tool skills, your, especially your hand plane skills, like I'll get out. You're doing great, Big D. <laughs> you keep too. Holding the board down for me, I appreciate keep it. Keep doing a good job, Big D. Big D. Hey. Thank you for bringing an inspection light. Uh, these things are worth their weight in gold. We had some heavy tear out down here, and we came down and we looked at it. That is eliminated. Yes, we got some plane tracks. Who cares? We'll work a little of this. That's wacky grain. A sander, a Rotex can take care of that. But I just made a mark here, and that's what we're going to hit right now. Um, with the, I'll hit it with a smoother just to knock that out, save some time sanding. We are almost at the elimination of that dip. I think the rest can be sanders. These here, you see these little lines here? Those are plain tracks. To eliminate that, I have a cambered blade on here. To eliminate that, I can take the lateral adjuster like this and take it off to the side. I'm always checking for plane marks. Yes, will that sand out perfect? Yes. I'm not too worried about this. I just worry about tear out. Yeah. Okay, so an inspection light, raking light like that. And we will use this in our final <laughs> It's a decent broom too. It is, it's pretty cool. We will use this, and I like this over here. I'll work that a little bit. That's some uh, a little knot area where a tree came out. I may work that with a scraper. We'll see how the, but boy, these are worth their weight in gold. We have taken down this side really well and this side really well. So what we've done is we had a wide gap or wide cup. Now it's a lot more narrower and a heck of a lot less. So what we're gonna do is we'll concentrate on here when we hit it with the Rotexes, All right. and you'll see it'll level out. The thing I wanna do right now, and I'll teach you a new hand plane, is we can look in here. This is tear out we had. It's not that bad. Yeah, we can sand it out, but the more we can take it out before we hit it with the Rotex, the more time we'll save. And I got a really cool hand plane for that. I see a little right here. Okay. This will just help in the, the long run. And guess where all that nasty tear out is, right where it should be, <laughs> you know, where all that grain is crazy. But what we're going to do, and this, this, it's just natural for this to happen. It's, this was the toughest area Ooh. right in there. But there's little marks that I'm making here, okay, so we can address this with what we call a scraper plane. What I like to use is, I've had this for a long time, you'll see it's a, the blade is set back like a cabinet scraper. But I could take this, and it makes quick work of something like this. And I could scrape a lot of that tear out, or get it close enough, so when I hit it with my Rotex sander, I can get it right where I need it. Nice. Whew, kind of a workout. Just a little bit. <laughs> so, this is really good, Big D, because I'm showing you the way it was always done with hand planes, scrapers, scraper planes. Um, I think at this moment, now we can hit the Rotex, address that end down there. Okay. A little bit for dip. Doesn't matter, like Marianne, my wife says, 
you got to leave some imperfections in there, okay? But we have done a lot of flattening over the last day. So what we're going to do is we're going to move on to sanding, but initial flattening of sanding because we still got to address the natural edge. So we're going to uh, hit some Rotex in certain areas. There's a little, a little more tear out here that I want to address. Uh, other than that, I think we've got just about everything. Sounds good. So let's hit it with the Rotex and then we'll take a final look. So the only thing we're going to do today is hit it at 40. We will go after we do the natural edge and before we hit it with Rubio, then we'll do our final sandings and we'll step up to about 150. Okay, but let's get it where we need to do our final leveling process. We chose 40 grit for this. Yes, and you'll see where this will attack pretty good. One of the things, like I mentioned earlier, is everything is fairly flat up top here. We just got to address some more tear out. But what we want to do in the beginning, and that's why I'm going to mark this like this, okay, is you're going to be on this side, I'll be on this side. And we're going to get, because there's just that slight dip in there. Right. All right, so what's next? Okay, so I want you to eyeball that down there and tell me how we did. Uh, it's uh, pretty <coughs> wicked flat, I'd say. It's pretty what? Wicked flat. I like that. Man, you're becoming a northerner. Okay, there's only one other thing I'm going to do. We checked the whole slab. I'm going to take my straight edge. This is not the final sanding. So when we look at this, I'm just inspecting for a heavy tear out and we have got everything accomplished that we had circled. No heavy tear out. Of course, you're going to see some huge scratches. Those are the 40 grit. Right. So now I think we're going to hit the natural edge. All right, Sedge, how are we going to attack this edge? Sedge edge? Really? Okay. Um, Hashtag Sedge edge. <laughs> that's right. So I want to keep it as natural as possible. Um, and there's a variety of things we're going to use. We're going to use the draw knives uh, to remove some of the old back or more so the cambium. We're okay. going to use uh, rotary discs or flap wheels for the power drill. We're going to use a brand new tool I got called the Restorer. It works fantastic. Okay. I'll show you how that works. And we're going to use the Rotex sander. And to get into the nooks and crannies, maybe some chisels. So this is what I meant by keeping as much as possible. This is basically where I'm going to sit. Okay, this here is a piece that we're going to have to take off because it's already cracked. So I'll attack that from underneath, but I still like this ledge here. So, but I don't want a sharp edge, so I'll show you how to do that. We'll remove this little uh, branch. But when I say I want to keep as much as natural, look at that beautiful wave in there. Wow. What we want to do is we have some cambium fibers in here. I want to take out these uh, uh, insect marks. Over here, same thing. This is the tough part, but if you look at this natural wave in here, that's basically the grain. Yeah. So I want to keep some of that. I want to remove this um, aged uh, oxidized wood. So Chris, I'm going to have you back up. I'll come down here. And this is what we're going to get to before our final sanding, Big D, uh, using draw knives. I like this little tumble home um, design feature as I brought it up over here. We'll do it down there on that side. Okay. It's natural over here. So it's just a variety of different tips and tricks I can show you on how to attack this. Let's do it. You bet. I see a lot of times on social where a lot of people are using drawer knives. Um, I have several, the two we're going to use, and we'll start with this for the small stuff. We'll just take it like this. What you're doing is you're drawing it to you. And that is digging in, so sometimes I'll take it and bevel down for a little less cut. Now, I want you to feel the difference. This is a, a larger one, and you'll see where I can really hog out Ooh. a lot of material. But you've got to be careful because grain will pull it up. So you got to be watch your grain. And if you get too much, it's time to switch directions. Okay. Wow. I really like how that's starting to get in there. I mean, we'll hit that with the Rotex and everything, but it's starting to peel it away pretty good. Let's see. It's a back and forth with tools, like right here. I don't like this. It's kind of punky. So I'm going to start taking some of that back like this. I don't want to lose a lot of that, but I don't want that imperfection. That's right where I'm going to be standing. So I'll start doing some of that like here. And I'll start to shape this a little bit better because this is where my arms are going to be at the desk. 
and I'll start taking some of that out. But boy, the, the combination of these tools is really awesome. All right, Sedge, so what are we gonna do about this guy right here? Are we gonna grind it down or what? Well, we could, but won't we just take a, a saw like this and make quick work out of it? Because we're gonna be sanding that anyhow. Nice. Cool. All right, Sedge, so, so how are we gonna attack this? All right, Chris, come over here so we can see this. This has a variety of different ledges and bumps and nooks and crannies. So I'm gonna have you work the restorer here around the knot and come in here. The other thing you gotta remember is there's a lot of cambium. What cambium is, is the inner, I always call it the inner bark. You have the outer bark and this is the inner bark and you have some fibers still left over. Okay. So I may take a chisel to get in these nooks and crannies here, but I'm gonna have you start to work this with a restore. Okay. So there's a little areas in here where I'm gonna to start to use a chisel, but I gotta be very careful with it as I break everything else out. I don't wanna, it's just that there's some nasty cambium fibers in there. That, see that? Remember at the beginning I said there's gonna be a series of tools, mm -hmm. especially when we get into these nooks and crannies and little undulations in this area here. We hit it with a store, we came in with some chisels. Now we're gonna get some of the loose debris out of there. Okay. So what I have here is a nylon brush, but I use a high speed. This is a, a, a hammer drill. I put it in uh, four and you're going to see where that starts to take some of that debris out. So when we start looking at this, this is the bottom of the table now, mm -hmm. and we don't want any of these knife edges because um, you could hit your uh, thighs with them. What we're gonna do is we're gonna slowly fare those, but not extensively like the top was that rounded over. Right. Uh, we also have to attack this area here. I wanna get rid of this. I hate to, but that is where I'll be sitting. You can see where it's already cracked. Right. So I'll probably take it to about here like that okay. and we'll remove that. And it's just simple. I'm just gonna, and we soften the edges. I'm just gonna take a draw knife and slowly Take it now, like this. Okay, Big D, another great tool to work this natural edge in here. It's, ba you know how we have card scrapers? Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is a different type of scraper. You get these anywhere. This is, the brand name is called Baco. Uh, originally it was called Sandvik. And I've used these a lot when I'm working on staircases to scrape uh, old paint out in the corners. And you'll see, this scraper point has three points, so I could take that with a Phillips and rotate it, and I have a fresh edge all the way around. Nice. It's insert tooling. That is carbide. And we can work, like in here, Chris, get in here. So some of this, I'm having a little difficult time getting some of that late, uh, oh, that cambium out of there. So I'm gonna have you work this. I'm gonna tell you what, this makes quick work of everything. So Big D, what we did on that side with the draw knives, uh, we're going to start taking down now on this side, same process, but if we look at this side, Chris, come in, there's not a lot to do and it's going to go fairly quick. I just like this because that was my practice area. So we're just going to hit it with draw knives and go from there. Big D, what do you got there? It's my R090. Have you ever used it? Uh, a couple times, but I try to keep it clean. Oh, you're full of it. But you've never <laughs> even used it. Hey. Uh, I want to make sure that people watching this video understand this. One of the best tools I have ever used for a natural edge. It makes quick work of it. In this video, I'm teaching Big D how to do it with hand tools and some of the new tools out there. If you have an RO90, you have a great way of treating a natural edge. So uh, let's get going. I just, uh, Chris, come down here so we can see how quick of this is. Big D, I, you got 40 on there, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so yep. I'm gonna take it and you're gonna see where with the draw knife here, okay, uh, took quite a big dip out. And magically that grain's appearing. We've taken those uh, heavy cuts out. So you can see it's basically a grinder with killer dust extraction. So we're gonna have at this. We'll start with 40 grit, because we're gonna leave it like that until final sanding. 
but we're going to take all the heavies or the flats out and then we'll go with our uh, RO, um, our interface pads. Chris came in here so you can see this. We still have some of those wire scratches in there. I want to eliminate those. I'm going to keep this here. I'll ferret, but this makes quick work of it, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. I'm using it on edge, so the reason I say have an additional uh, hard pad is you may wear out the pad. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to wear this one out, so check it out. I'm gonna come in here and start working these areas. What this does is that you'll see that, feel that. And we're, we're I, cause I wanna get in those nooks and crannies with the edge of the pad. So you wanna, I always wanna have that natural edge feeling, mm -hmm. but you just gotta be careful cause it makes really quick work. Of it. Yeah, it does. I need to have something that kinda fares this, but also doesn't leave flat spots. So it'll follow the contour, and that's what an interface pad does. It actually, and if we can get in here, Chris, this is, I think, one of the greatest things about Rotec sanders and all the sanders at Festool is these interface pads. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna put it on here, line up the holes, and you're gonna see how I'm gonna come in here and start to work this with the interface pad. And it really allows you to soften that edge absolutely perfect. Man, Big D, great job. I really appreciate the help. Mm -hmm. I, uh, this is really cool because we did the top and we stopped, we did it all with 40 to level. And now all the natural edge has fared the way we want it. Oh yeah. And it's at 40 grit. It's a lot of work. It is, isn't it? <laughs> There's a reason they call it wood working. Working's a much longer word, but it is a ton of work. I can't thank you enough. Uh, I think you picked up quite a few skills. Yes, sir. So you can see when we do the natural edge, it is just a progression of tools to get it where you want. Right. All right, Sedge, is it time for sanding? It is my favorite thing. <laughs> I don't know too many people who like sanding Big D, but it's just that natural progression we have to go through because we want our finish, which is gonna be Rubio Monaco, to work perfect. I don't wanna be sitting at this desk and seeing a lot of swirl marks. Uh -oh. So what did we finish this top, bottom, and natural edge with? 40. Okay, so Chris, come in here so we can look. What we have now is perfectly level. We don't have to spend a lot of time. The next grit we're gonna to go to, see, see all those little scratch patterns? All right, we're gonna go to 60 to remove the 40. That's all, we don't have to level anymore. We don't have to uh, work the edge anymore. We just have to remove 40 grit marks. And that's where I think a lot of people don't go through that process going, oh, I gotta, a lot of people start with 80 to level and they spend forever on it. So finish sanding, as we progress, we're gonna do uh, 60, 80, 120 and 150 and be done with it. We'll start with the bottom, of course, go through all the grits, then we'll flip it over, we'll attack the top, okay? Okay, and then we'll do the sides with the RO90. And we'll choose the right machine to remove, as I say the paper is always the tool, and we'll choose the right machine to do so. You're gonna be on that side, I'm gonna be on this side. We'll work it back and forth, remember the pattern back and forth, to and fro, in 68 inch circles. So the way you, I don't go all the way down and all the way back. What I do is I break it up into sections. We'll third, third, and a third this. We'll go from here to here. Then we'll step and do this. And then we'll do this, back and forth. Then we'll inspect it. Big D, we just finished with 60 grit. Yep. And here's a step that a lot of people forget to do. What happens is that 60 grit, as we're sanding, is breaking down and creating new sharp edges on the grit. But there's sometimes it comes off the side. Ooh. So before we move on to 80 grit, what we're gonna do is it's gonna be a quick sweep of the board, 
okay to remove any particles of uh, 60 grit that's left on there and we're gonna wipe it okay. okay that way there we stand a chance I know some people blow it off uh, you can do that I just like to wipe it off just to make sure so we don't get any unnecessary swirl marks from a lower grit Big D thanks for all your help this is going really well I think we just finished with 80 grit. Yes, sir. Okay, and we had the Rotex RO and 50s in Rotex mode. Mm -hmm. After 80 grit, it's where I've always made the jump. We're gonna go to 120 grit, and we're gonna put them in random orbit, and it's as simple as taking it from the coarse dots to the fine dots, and it's now in random orbit. Okay. And let's continue the journey. All right. So let's move on to 150 grit. We got it wiped off and be done with the bottom. Let's go for it. You bet. Okay, big D, it's rinse and repeat. All right. All right. <laughs> we just sanded the bottom, mm -hmm. we flipped it over. Remember we sanded this at 40 grit? Yep. What's the next grit we have to start with? 60. And we're gonna start and do the exact same thing. Here we go. And Chris, hopefully you can come over here and get this. Uh, now comes what I call the dance on the edge here. Okay. See, look how deep those 40 grit cut marks are. That's Let's crazy that. compared to the top. Right. So what we need to do is get our, our interface pads on there, on our RO90s, and we're slowly gonna go, and we also have to break this edge ever so slightly. Okay. But you don't wanna go too far here. Right. Okay, and we're gonna blend it. We're gonna do, of course, 60, 80, 120, and 150. Yes, sir. And we'll flip it over. The other thing we're gonna do is we're going to lift the slab and we're gonna put a blanket underneath now because we don't want any undue scratching because of the, the top here, the wood, the wood to wood connection. Okay? Okay, big D. Now comes the final sanding of the natural edge. All right. And it is, there's a, if we check this out, see that is where the 150 is, mm -hmm. okay? But it's the scratch marks from the 40 are right here and right here. So one of the things you, we'll put the interface pad on and we're gonna create a few more scratches up here which we'll take care of. But we're gonna take it, work it like this, but also come in here to start knocking that edge over as okay. well. This is what I call the dance. It's gonna take some time. We'll have to probably flip it over, work the edge here a little bit. It's a back and forth, but as we go, we'll check it out and see where we end up. But we want to make, we want to take this 40 grit, which it's sanded at, right. to the 150 grit. Sounds good. Okay, and it's just a simple technique like this. Uh... Hey, hey, Big D, what do you think? Uh, it's night and day, my guy. Okay, so let's think about our time. An hour on the back, an hour on the top, and about an hour. We just did three hours of sanding. Whew. Do you think we're finished? Hell no. Well, what we're gonna do is, we'll probably do a final sand before we hit it with the Rubio. Okay. We're gonna let it sit a week. We have to because of filming, but we'll come back and we'll just hit everything with 150. Should take us about a half hour. Then we'll hit it with the Rubio. Sounds good. We sanded this to 150. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go over it really quick with our uh, random orbit sanders, and we're gonna sand it final grit. Okay. And we don't wanna polish it, okay? Because the Rubio says 120. So we're gonna turn our sanders down a little bit so it's a little bit slower. Okay. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna water pop it. So stay tuned, baby. Okay, Big D, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do our first wipe down. Let's not try to get our hands touching this because we gotta do final inspection. Okay. And then what we'll do is where the knots are and the cracks and crevices will blow out. And that is just one of several steps before we put on the oil. All right, Sage, what's next? Okay, it's time for a little math. We're gonna do a little mixing. So when you get Ruby, I get the, I get the small cans. This top can's 275, the bottom 75. 
On the side of the can, it says you're going to mix it to a 3 to 1 ratio. I like to keep the math easy. If this is 75, all right? So what we're going to do is, the way I've always done it is I've taken, like, part A, and if that's 275, I divide that by 3, I get 91 for my second pot. But being that's only 75, I'm going to borrow another 25 millimeters to make that 300 because I could pour that whole can of accelerator in there. Now, always remember this. The accelerator is great, but you don't need it because you can just put it on there. You just get a longer cure time. Okay. This, this accelerates the cure. So let's get a mixing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take this and I'm going to pour the whole can of Rubio. A little is a lot with Rubio. This should be enough for the table. Okay, and I'm just going to let that drain. We'll empty it out. Okay, good. Now I'm going to borrow 25 from here, and I get a separate mixing cup. I know some people use syringes. That's fantastic as well. But I like this. It's already pre... I have the measurements right here on the side. And if you prefer ounces and do the conversion, you can do that as well. But I'm just going to take a little more oil. So big date, as we go through this and we're mixing and everything we use, because this is a natural oil, okay, we will take and we will put it in a five gallon bucket of water overnight because of spontaneous combustion with natural oil. Okay, so we're just gonna be very careful. Anything we wipe off, anything that touches the oil, I'm a fanatic about it, I always have, because yes, years ago I had a little bit of a, a brush with spontaneous combustion. Oh. And another great application, hey, look at the long dominoes. <laughs> they make excellent, excellent paint stirrers or oil stirrers. Whoop, 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 whoop. Okay, Big D, we're fine. We got our final sanding. We have no scratch marks that we can tell. <laughs> um, we tested our water pop. So we're going to water pop the top and sides. Who cares about the bottom? But we are going to finish the bottom first. Okay. So what I'm going to do, and it's pretty simple. I got a spray here. I'm just going to test it. I want full spray. And there you go. And it's that simple. Okay. And I'm just going to start rubbing this excess off. Yes, this will help clean it, but it's actually raising the grain. We've blown it off, wiped it off, water popped it. <laughs> now, I tell you, it's a lot of prep work. But now we're going to use the Rubio Monocoat cleaner. And you'll be surprised as we do this. We have cotton, 100% cotton to do this. And when I pour it on, we're going to spread it around just like this. And you're going to see we're still going to pull a little bit of dust out of there. All right, so let's give it a clean. All right. It's simple, Big D. Just like on the sample, we're going to start to rub this in. You can actually come over and grab some. Okay. No, from oh, there and bring it okay. over. Okay. We want to spread this out. Nice and actually work it in. I mean, for a finish, an oil finish, this really is a no brainer finish. You mix it, apply it, let it set for 15 minutes, and wipe it off. Look at that. Oh, wow, wow, big D, come here. Look at that, huh? Wow. <laughs> Too bad this is the bottom. <laughs> um, the bottom's ready to wipe down. We waited 15 minutes, we had pushed it into the pour. And it's just real simple, wipe it all off, and then we'll flip it and hit the top side. We stayed away from the edges. Yep. So we do the tops and the edges all at once. Let's take it off. All right. Wow. Man, is that nice. Okay, so, big D. What we did was we flipped this over. So the bottom is finished. And then we took some uh, particle board, a uh, quarter inch, whatever, so it would sit flat on top of the STM. But I need to get air under there to, to uh, cure. So big deal, I'm gonna have you lift this up. And I made these, these are homemade painter's pyramids. I made it with my Capex. So I have four of them underneath here. Go ahead, big D. I don't care if it leaves a little point on the bottom of the desk, it's gonna be noticeable. The only thing I care about is getting air for a full cure. And now we can attack the top with some beautiful Rubio Monocoat. Um, I've been waiting for this moment. Let's put some Rubio on the top. Let's stay away from some of these cracks and crevices. 
And I'll show you how to attack those. But there you go. And there's some Rubio. Woo! Let's wipe her off. And always remember, you're always flipping that rag, turning it in and out. And man, is that going to be a nice desk. Yeah, it is. Wow. <laughs> I think that is the right word, Big D. Holy moly, have we put a lot of time into this. Hey, thanks. Oh, happy to help. A uh, couple of things to remember. It, it's, we're going to keep our hands off of this now. we got to walk away from it. Uh, tomorrow, we'll, uh, it's able to be touched. But we won't because we want to let it cure for a week. Okay. And boy, we got, a, I think, one or two more videos after this. So make sure everybody stays tuned to this. Also, very important, we're going to go around the shop now. Everything that touched the oil will go in that five-gallon pail of water. Yep. Because we want to be very safe and not have any spontaneous combustion because it does happen. The big thing we needed for the slab, because the slab that we're going to put on top of this uh, needed the sturdiness mm -hmm. to it. That's why I got the I-beam for the bottom and the V2 commercial because I can extend it all the way out to 72 inches. Okay. Okay, this way. It has the right depth for us as well. And I upgraded a couple things on it. All right, Sedge, what's first? I really don't know. <laughs> we gotta find the instructions. I've never put anything together like this before. So I'm pretty excited. I know one's the uh, I-beam for below. I know one's the feet and the supports for the desk. Okay. I got the wider supports down below because of the width or breadth of the, of the slab top. And this looks like this is the majority of it. So what I always do when I assemble something, I unpack everything, we'll spread it out here. We'll look at the directions and we'll get going. I don't even know what tools we need. I imagine <laughs> we need a, a screwdriver and some sockets. Let's get to work. <laughs> wow, I think this is the motor, Big D. Look at this, this is super. Feel this, it's super heavy duty. Oh, geez. Crazy. <laughs> Man, that's nice. Now I'm excited. I already know I made the right choice. You know it's quality because it's heavy. Yeah, baby. Okay, Big D, I'm gonna tell you. This is really cool. What you got? It's not a big old bag of bolts. Look how they've separated <laughs> that's everything. Awesome. Isn't that wicked cool? Nice. Okay, Big D, it's kind of cool. We're starting to delve into the instruction manual. I really like this, the way they have the parts labeled, and you know you need pay, packet H1, it's right here, packet H2, you can see by the diagram. Uh, these are all labeled as well. We got extra parts. What's also cool is we also have a five millimeter hex, a four millimeter. I think we're gonna just start putting this together and let some B-roll roll. Let's do it. Okay, here's a quick tip that we uh, ran into. And we put the, uh, when you're doing the I-beam and you're doing the setup, okay, make sure you have a friend with you, <laughs> okay? Over here, these bottom ones here and here, which will be on the top when we flip this over, what we did is we hooked up the motor and all the controls, and to get a better access to these, Boy, is this quiet, Big D. Mm -hmm. I hope you can see this, but the guys wanted me to show you this tip that I did. I, I had cut this previously. This is a 70 inch uh, piece of plywood, and I want to bring it up here so you can see it. Okay, and there's a reason I did this, because I was measuring out on my desk, and I'll bring it over there in a minute. But there's a center line on these cross beams that are tightened with the eight hex screws here. Okay, I wanted to pre-assemble it, so I lined up my center line with that. That makes it easier, that gives me the frame, so in a little while I can take this, bring it down on the floor, and what we can do is put the slab on there, because we don't have any pre-drilled holes, and we'll do that on another video coming up. But this is what I did originally, because when you look at the slab here, this is gonna be the top, but I wanted to maximize that V2, right here and with that i-beam i know it's going to be stable enough so we're going to test it out in a couple minutes okay the uplift desk is fully assembled we're ready to get it mounted to the slab but you know when you 
get something and then all of a sudden you figure something out toward the end. I didn't know it had this feature. If I have an uneven surface, I can level these real easy. To anchor the frame to the slab desk that I have built, I have measured the thickness of the slab, which is two inches, 50 millimeter. I chose these screws here. They're self-tapping. They got a washer head, and we're gonna put them in the three. We need six of them. Okay, now, these are self-tapping. If you have, use another screw, <laughs> make sure that you take all the measurements properly um, if you're doing your own desktop. Um, make sure, and this is how I looked at these at the hardware store, I wanted to make sure that's a washer head, which will pull it tight to the desktop. If you don't have a self-tapping screw uh, and an impact driver, make sure you pre-drill. Make sure you set your drill depth properly because you don't want to go through. And there's another thing I always eyeball. I know this is 50 millimeter, but I'll take my screw like that. I know I'm not going to punch through because I have seven millimeters from the top of the gasket to there. So I got plenty of bite on there and I wanted to choose and I believe these are an inch and three quarter. Hey, I wanted to mention this. When you are anchoring your frame, your uplift frame, to your slab, make sure you're conscientious of all the wires. Yeah, you have a small space here and you can tuck them in, but just make sure you're not putting wires underneath here and you're not pinching them. Also, I will have put this on the desk. This is my um, uh, control panel that I have, and I am going to position that in the uh, office to make sure it's in the right position where I have my computer and my workstation. Okay, so here's another tip for you. <laughs> After you throw all the screws in and you've measured and measured, this is one of those things that every single woodworker does is they go, Phew, I don't feel anything sticking through. <laughs> Always check your screws at each and every one because you may have taken a longer one and thrown in there and you don't want to end up with that poking through on the top. If you remember at the beginning of the video, okay, we set this up and we weighed the ash slab and it was 130 pounds. And this has plenty of upward movement for it. And you'll see it's solid, it's stable. So I'm gonna bring it down here, but I wanna bring in a guest. And I wanna show you how, I'll probably have about maybe 50, 60 pounds on here. But I wanna bring in Mackenzie because this will hold, let's sit right about here, Mackenzie. This will hold the slab and one Mackenzie. This is, this two motor design commercial is very solid and very stable. So one of the things I did in the very beginning of starting to uh, prepare the slab was one, I knew the uplift desk that I ordered, I could go all the way up to 72 inches. So I made a story pull for that. But the slab overall, from the length of it to the, longest part of that limb that comes off the crotch of the slab is 86 inches and I bought that a few years ago and I don't want to cut it down anymore so what I did is I made an 86 inch story pole for this room and Marianne and I decided you know what we'll work the other furniture we have in here but this is where it's going to be placed and we were in here going okay we could come from this wall this wall or here but I don't want it to look too crowded in here, so always make yourself something like this. It's a story pole. It's just, this is just throwaway plywood that I had ripped up, but it gives you a sense of your space so you can make the right decisions if you have to uh, cut down your piece of furniture to make it right, measure it. So I hope this tip helps. So it's been a fantastic process 
from selecting the slab to processing the slab to making sure that it's level, the natural live edge is exactly the way I wanted it, to the uplift commercial V2 with the I-beam. You could see how stout it is inside this office. And man, I couldn't be happier. Hey, thank you for watching. And don't forget, each segment is broken up in the playlist of Live Edge Desk Build. Hey, as I always say, be positive and stay sharp. Wicked sharp.